Hello, everybody. So <clears throat> I'm also slightly sad that we don't have Van Halen playing in the background, but there we go. Let's make the most of this. I know it's 4 p.m., the end of a, uh, a long day of listening to information overload, which is part of this presentation, actually. So I've got this big challenge where <clears throat> I'm talking about a couple of really topical aspects of the digital entertainment landscape, which is the challenges for the DTC landscape, direct to consumer landscape around retention, engagement, and growing propositions in what is becoming increasingly challenging landscape. So I'm going to show you how I'm going to approach this. Bearing in mind, I've only got 20 minutes to cover this extensive topic. What I want to do is <clears throat> I want to set the framework for how we are in this situation where Growth is still expected, but we've got some really big macro trends that are disrupting strategic objectives to grow streaming propositions. And we're going to look at what those look like. We're not like the fragmentation challenge, the, the reality that we've gone through a great unbundling experience of the last 15 years, and we're at that inflection point where Streaming is now streaming TV. And what does that mean from the point of view of how to approach the two big challenges that are literally arriving and disrupting a whole range of different businesses above and beyond uh, digital entertainment, but have particular relevance for digital entertainment because they are directly pertinent to retention minimizing churn, and ideally growing subscriber bases. That's it. The attention recession, I'll go into detail about what that is in a moment. And then the cost of living crisis, the, the reality that we're now moving into an inflationary environment for the first time ever in the digital economy. We've had recessions before, but we've never had to factor in inflation for consumers. Most consumers have never had to experience approaching double-digit inflation and what that actually means. Um, I'm then going to give you a brief overview of the strategic objectives that have been a core part of M&A strategy for building direct-to-consumer propositions of the last five years, which media helpfully defines as with the acronym GOLF. So that's genres, originals, libraries, and formats. And I'll give you a few examples of how that's played out. And then we'll just sum up with some, some of the key takeaways from what I've shared with you. So let's go into how we got here. So <clears throat> this slide is really just to set the scene for why direct-to-consumer has become such an important part of TV-type consumption. And we see here there's two trends going in opposite directions. And this is based upon media research quarterly consumer uh, data. Uh, <clears throat> so going back to uh, 2017, Q2 2017, right up to uh, the previous quarter. And we can see clearly that pay TV is on the decline. No surprise there, I'm sure. But also, I wanted to highlight the growth in multiple digital subscriptions. Now, I've chosen digital subscriptions rather than just video or video plus subscriptions because it's important to recognize that TV is no longer a standalone mainstream, t sorry, mainstream entertainment proposition. Video is what TV has become. Video is a streaming-centric digital native proposition where video competes with all other types of media entertainment, which are in the main subscription-based, uh, they're certainly attention-based, and they are competing for finite attention time, finite uh, discretionary incomes. And this is really just to illustrate the fact that we're approaching, there's still some way off yet, but we're approaching a convergence point where big traditional pay TV subscription models are 
being replaced by multiple subscriptions with multiple hybrid experiences, which create their own challenges and tensions, but fundamentally push TV into competing directly with previously distinct entertainment types, such as games, music, uh, and all the other offerings available in the digital entertainment world. So, having said that, I'm going to take a, a closer look at some of the leading players. Uh, this is looking at the leading uh, DTC players in the UK by um, weekly active user engagements for uh, video subscriptions, so SVOD services. Now, calling this out because the leading incumbent Netflix has recently come up against unexpected challenges and is falling out of favor with the financial community because they had that 0.1% decline in global subscribers in Q1. Um, and also, they've had to make some announcements about cost cutting on their, uh, and their um, staff levels. This is occurring at the same time that Netflix is actually doing a really good job of retaining engagement. Netflix is one of those few digital propositions that is the byword for what it does. So Netflix, Spotify, um, <clears throat> there are a few other examples, but these are the primary ones. It's, they, it has that market share, but it's almost a utility from the point of view of digital consumers. And if you look at the difference between weekly active users and daily active users and the ratio between the two of them, Netflix is the best performing one here. And when we're thinking about video as being a digital entertainment proposition, we've got to recognize that the, the golden KPI here is daily active user engagement because that's what all the other apps are measuring. And it's an app-based uh, an app-based marketplace now. So monthly active users no longer cuts it. Can you think about where the first point of contact is for most streaming services, it's through the smartphone, and then it expands beyond into smart TVs, et cetera. If you have a app you only engage with once a month, it's one step away from being deleted from your phone. So really, we're looking at weekly active users as the minimum, and daily active users is that goal where if a video service gets to that position, it becomes a TV-like experience because TV, when it works best, is a daily part of people's lives. And I'll, I'll go on to how streaming services can do that more uh, later on in the presentation. So let's have a closer look at Netflix paid subscribers. Now, the... The, perhaps the surprising thing is the, the level of overlaps between paid subscribers of one service with other services. All the leading services have significant overlaps where subscribers are subscribing to multiple services. And I'll show you in a moment just what those ratios look like with single video subscriptions versus multiple video subscriptions. But the potential warning signs for Netflix's dominance for attention share at the moment, in this case in the UK, is the fact that Netflix subscribers over-index for the two leading competitors that are desperately trying to disrupt Netflix's dominance. And you think about it, Netflix is a entertainment first proposition which doesn't have a lot of the key ingredients of traditional pay TV. The glaring example here is sports. Amazon Prime has sports. There's also uh, Disney Plus is also growing out sports propositions in markets where it can do so, bundling with ESPN Plus in the US. Disney Hotstar in India has the largest um, sports streaming service by collocated views. Netflix doesn't have sports doesn't have news, which is a key driver of daily active user engagement for traditional TV. Uh, and it's fundamentally has decided to go after a specific type of genre and uh, content format, which puts it at risk for other services that are trying to be substitutive TV rather than an additive service. 
So let's look at the fragmentation challenge. So this is the ratio of people who say that they subscribe to a video service versus those who subscribe to more than one video service, going back to uh, the beginning of 2018. Quarterly on quarterly consumer survey from media research. And we can see some interesting trends here, which aren't always apparent when you're just looking at quarter on quarter numbers. Media has been in the fortunate position where we've been tracking this kind of data all the way back to Q4 2016. And you see the long term trend is actually a plateauing of engagement for video services. So there has been some growth in the last quarter, which is a good sign. But if you look at the long term trends, there seems to be an upper ceiling for video subscriptions. And this, if you think about it, this actually closely aligns with traditional TV, where you never had, it was the subscription models only ever served the minority of consumers. The majority of consumers uh, engaged with free to air or broadcast um, uh, broadcast TV. And we, the same thing applies with streaming, whereas there's an upper limit. In the upper limit, it looks like half the population or half of 16 plus consumers are willing to pay for access to a video service. Now, we're still seeing an increase in multiple video services because we're still seeing the after effects of what media described as the D2C Big Bang moment of 2019 to 2021, where we had multiple new entrants coming in, such as Disney Plus, Peacock, HBO Max, Paramount Plus, uh, Apple TV Plus. Um, and they came in and they, they used their own ecosystems to be able to drive engagement of mainstream consumers, which has created this uplift and has created the expectation that consumers are going to be willing to tolerate multiple subscriptions. But the data suggests there's an upper limit to how many, how many multiple subscriptions are tolerated based upon the mainstream uh, willingness to have a single video subscription. So let's go on to the, the big impacts of how, how the overall long-term direction of travel for subscriptions is actually now being challenged by where we are right now in the economic and the uh, entertainment landscape of Q2 2022. And I'm talking about attention recession and the cost of living crisis. So first thing, I'm just going to give you the uh, high level overview of what, the, what these things actually mean in practice and how we got there. So 2019, we had peak attention. This is when media identified declining engagements with leading digital entertainment propositions. Uh, we noticed at first in games, a slight decline in mobile gaming and a number of other uh, associated behaviors. And it also coincided with announcements made by Reed Hastings, CEO and founder of Netflix, who talked about his main competitor was no longer Fortnite, it was actually sleep. I think what that means is the organic constraints. There's no more free time to be able to monetize time spent engaging with digital propositions because there literally physically isn't any more time. The days of launching a BuzzFeed listicle to, uh, to be able to monetize queuing up for a latte at Starbucks, those days are over. If you're launching a D2C service 2019 and beyond, they, those services have to disrupt incumbent established behavior. So it becomes a zero sum game. Now, 2020, we actually saw a reversal in this because in 2020, we had COVID. COVID introduced a, uh, a reversal of this long term secular trend because of lockdowns. So lockdowns, media calculated that the, uh, the great lockdowns of 2020 and 2021 created an additional 12% of time available for home entertainment. And we saw the numbers, we saw the increased levels of engagement for traditional TV. Uh, we saw the increased levels of streaming behavior over that time. 
there was this uplift and the associated, um, uh, the associated uh, increase in the market valuations of leading streaming services uh, such as Netflix and Amazon, etc., helped to create this narrative that we've got this growth back again. But all it's done, has, all it had done, is temporarily reverse the long term secular trend. 2021, as lockdowns eased, not only did this long term secular uh, deprioritize, deprioritization of time spent on entertainment and the digital, uh, digital choices start to decline due to attention fatigue, but also we had IRL, in real life entertainment alternatives, suddenly became available again. So after a year plus of being cooped up at home, people had the opportunities to go to concerts, to go to restaurants, to go to the cinema. And this all has created what media calls a uh, attention recession, where there's actually time being decreased from uh, the available time is being decreased because of the long-term deprioritization of time spent in the digital entertainment world alongside the return of IRL. Now, the, the tipping point for this, if that wasn't bad enough, is the cost of living crisis. And as I mentioned earlier on, this is a first for the digital economy because we've had recessions before and right at the start of COVID, there were concerns about abilities to pay for multiple subscriptions. We saw a noticeable increase in AVOD engagement. Uh, we've had earlier points of um, recessionary impacts in the digital economy, um, but there's never been an inflationary environment to deal with in developed economies. We're looking at 9 plus percent inflation in developed markets, this is the UK and the US. Now, if you think about that, what that means is someone has 10 digital subscriptions. It means at the end of the year, they're going to have to lose one of those digital subscriptions if they want to maintain the same, uh, the, the, the same um, uh, earning power and discretionary income that they had at the start of the year. These are big changes which, once they start trickling down into the mainstream awareness, directly impact upon willingness and tolerance to pay for additional services. Now, this is a, uh, an example of the, the previous tw uh, 12 months, the previous four quarters of um, time spent across leading entertainment formats, predominantly digital. And, I've put this slide together just to give you almost some counterintuitive uh, supporting evidence that we're seeing this attention recession. We're seeing this time being taken away from the digital entertainment landscape. Now, it's not even, it never is even uh, in, uh, when we're looking at big macro trends. So we can see some direct, direct winners of the great lockdown increase in time spent. Podcasts and audiobooks are noticeably up, as is music because these are things that were, they're digital, and they were, um, uh, they got that uplift during lockdown because when people had to exercise by themselves, walk by themselves, etc., they can listen to podcasts, audio books, music. They can continue to do that in an IRL-focused life. But other things such as gaming, have taken a hit. Streaming video has taken a hit. TV's taken a hit because people want to be out and about doing things and there's that attention fatigue which has been exacerbated by the, uh, the long-term trend towards fragmentation of, in, in our case, in the, the video world. So let's look at one potential way that streaming services, DTC services, can position themselves to be able to weather the coming storm. Because make no mistake about it, we're going into a recessionary environment. We're going into an environment where consumers are risk adverse and are basically trying to get more for less. Now, this strategy is uh, what media calls the golf strategy, the genres, originals, uh, library and formats. Two minutes.
and I just realized, potential recession myself, I've been going too slowly focusing this, so I'm going to rush through as quickly as I can in two minutes. So basically, um, high-level overview of golf is basically, these are the key drivers of M&A strategy for building direct consumer propositions. It's effectively replicating the pay TV offering so that we have streaming becoming a substitutive rather than an additive video experience. So effective it becomes streaming TV. It's not something you have in addition like Netflix. It's something you have instead of the traditional pay TV. It's the Paramount Plus, the Peacock, uh, HBO Max, etc. And I don't have time to go through it now, but we have a number of um, examples of how this plays out with reaggregation, which is the other big challenge for DTC services is how they position themselves to be able to compete in a world that needs to be re-aggregated. And a big part of this, which unfortunately I don't have time to go into too much detail now, is the move towards smart TVs opening up the app experience, which gives the opportunity for smaller niche services to be able to find their digital Nat Geo moment to have relevance in the, the new uh, streaming environment. So very quickly, uh, implications. Um, you, you can all read, so I can let you, uh, let you um, go for that yourselves. But fundamentally, we're talking about um, building a streaming TV landscape. Um, we're talking about prioritizing time spent, justifying reasons to engage, leveraging content IP and fighting for all the existing subscribers and attention because retention is going to be absolutely key over the next 12 months because the, the best case scenario is, is we've got 12 months of high inflation. Worst case scenario, this could be something much bigger. So really, it's about solidifying the gains that have been won over the last two years. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Here are the contact details. If you'd like to know more, very happy to discuss further at length. And thank you very much for your time.